Hello everybody, today on McLaren Week we're driving this, the 570 Spider. Now this discreetly specified supercar is owned by my good buddy James Dean, who's currently hiding over there being a baller in his fancy Gucci hoodie. But let's have a look at his car. Now this is actually being currently run alongside his Lotus XC's Cup 430, which will probably go at some point next year, but for now this is actually his daily driver. I'm going to do my very best to talk you through the specification, the looks of the car and everything as well as I can. However, if you want to just get straight to the driving portions, skip ahead to this time code. Alright, you're sticking with me. Okay, let's go through it. Originally, when he showed me the spec of the car he was looking to buy, I was, well, to be honest, completely and utterly indifferent. It's not how I would specify a car like this, but I can see the appeal of something that isn't massively shouty. Uh, you will probably notice the fact that it's parked next to a ridiculously shouty 720, which is going to be featured in my next video here on McLaren Week. The 570's looks I've never entirely gelled with. There are bits about it that I love. This pointy, sharp front end is absolutely awesome, and the lights, which kind of echo the sort of McLaren tick, but it's the side and back I never quite gel with. The, the, I love the detail. I love the sort of 3D effect, the sort of layered thing you've got here with these side intakes, but I'm just just this rear end, it just, it just sort of comes to sort of nothing basically and just all sort of droops down and just looks a little bit weird. Not, not a massive fan of it. However, I do like the really prominent diffuser here, nowhere near as big as on the 600 LT, which I think is generally a, a more successful car stylistically, but this is still cool. I love the fact that you can see a lot of the exhaust through here, which we'll talk about more in the driving portion. Let's see, big, big old section here. And it is overall a, a pretty cohesive looking thing. Got little 570 badges on the sides, and I want to also take this opportunity to point out um, one of the unfortunate issues of the car at the minute, which is the fact that um, this door over here is not lined up properly. This, this down here, does not sit right. Uh, the collection process of the car unfortunately wasn't as slick as it should have been and there was quite a few bits of damage to the car uh, there was a bad scratch on it and various different things you can sort of you can see the scratch there that was actually um, there from factory and some other bits I'll put pictures in of those and they're currently being sorted but let's take a look inside now to get into a 570 it's different for every McLaren on a, on a 720 you'd be looking up here on a 570 Put your hand down here and you'll feel a little rubber button just there. So you pop that and the door will rise up. Compared with the earlier McLarens, it's got a very scalloped side. The idea being you can get in it easier. Now you'll also notice the fact that this car is full of leaves because it is, as has been promised, being used. Specification of this car is a bit odd. It's got some nice things and it's also missing some things. One of the biggest omissions is the sound system. This has a bass four speaker stereo, which is absolutely garbage and has absolutely no place in the McLaren whatsoever. I don't care if you care about sound or not. In a car of this price, bearing in mind this is RRP, about 190 grand on the road, and it's just, well, it's just not good enough. What I do like though, is the fact that all of the switch gear and stuff in here is bespoke. But to get in a McLaren, by the way, similar to a Lotus, you put your left leg in as far as you can go and then fall down. With the roof up, or the roof down rather, it is rather easy. Now, the seat is actually pretty comfy. The view out the front is great. Now you can just about see the little haunches either side there and there, which I like. I don't kind of mind this. I don't like portrait screens. Really, not a big fan, and it's the same issue I've got with the 720 over there. Also, this has McLaren's Iris 2 system, which is pretty, pretty terrible. Have you got your keys, buddy? Down here, you've got drive neutral reverse. Uh, the parking switch is over here, and it does work the correct way. So you pull it to engage and push to turn it off. Interestingly for a McLaren, the seats in here are leather. Quite rare. Most McLarens have an awful lot of Alcantara, not a lot of leather. I like the leather, and it's good quality leather too. You got memory seats down here, and the red stitching and the red seat belts do lift an otherwise very, very dull interior. Now this is the key, and um, if you want to know the difference between a Super Series and a uh, Sports Series key, 
you can tell fairly easily because I have in my pocket the key to the 720 that's part next to me. And you can tell, look at that, that's the, that is the Sport Series, that is the Super Series. Nice painted glossy key and a peasant key. Now, Alcantara steering wheel, which I'm not a fan of, the material, but the wheel itself is actually lovely and the complete opposite to a Ferrari. No buttons, no nothing, just plain simple. Got your mirror adjustment here, parking sensors and whatnot. And I just want to show you, in sort of brief, my fundamental issue with McLaren's uh, system here, Iris. So Iris 1 is the first one, as you can imagine, and Iris 2 is the second. So I'm just going to turn the ignition on. I'm going to try and turn the ignition on. Okay. Hey, there we go. So, let's uh, turn that down. So let's just say you want to go somewhere, okay? Let's just say you want to go, I don't know, to uh, to Woking or whatever. Oh, so that's just turned itself off. So, yep, yep, handy. So, you hit nav. And uh, there's, your, there's your map. And it's like, okay. How do you type in a destination? I mean, you could think maybe that, right? It looks like a navy looking button. No, that just brings it to there. Oh, well, what about the McLaren button, maybe? Oh, uh, no, no, that brings it back to the menu. Okay, all right, well, well, that's that's for the 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 fan and the controls. And by the way, heated seats in this are are roasty hot. They're very very good. Well, that's voice control, obviously. That's that's mute, and 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 that's settings. So it, it can't be in settings, can it? Well, except there's no settings button here. So you have to go to here, and then you have to press settings. And then it's there. Why is it in the settings? There's a settings button. That is a settings icon. Is that, uh, please, people of the comments, please tell me, does that not look like a settings icon to you? Because it does to me. What that should be is, is the burger icon, the little three lines, because that, that to me says more. And this, in this age of, you know, everyone on phones and things like that, that, that should be the burger icon. That should just be more. Uh, and and the, the, the nav, you should listen anyway, the nav is absolutely, totally terrible. These later 570s have one digital display here, which looks a little bit small, a little bit piddly. Not the highest resolution, but it kind of tells you what you need it to. This car is equipped with the lift system. To get a lift system in a McLaren, you're going to hold up on here, and it'll do it. But it won't do it while the engine is not running, understandably. Uh, one of the best bits about a Spider is the fact that you can lower the little glass behind. And you can do that when the roof is up, which if it's a kind of mm day, then that just makes life a lot easier. They are very, very practical cars. There's plenty of storage up front, and yeah, it's 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 nice in here. It's it's nice in here. I would like the spec a little bit different. Um, there's some odd things like it's black stitching in the middle, but red on the side. We think that's for reflections. I think that's a deliberate choice on McLaren's behalf. Um, the rearview mirror looks a little cheap compared to say the one in the Audi R8, but then all these all these levers and things here are all really, really beautiful. Um, the one big paddle, as everybody knows, so they you can go up or down um, from either side because you can do that thing. But all your switches down here, handling sport track, um, normal sport track. Um, we're gonna talk about those a bit more when we're on the road, but that is the car in brief. Now in the interest of a better picture today, we do have the roof down, because let's face it, that is the only way to experience any kind of convertible supercar. Now when it comes to rivals, you've got to think very carefully about what you should actually be comparing this car with. And I do believe that this should only be compared really with other supercars. McLaren themselves will try and pretend that this isn't a supercar, they'll tell you it's a sports car. But I'm, I'm sorry McLaren, you are fooling absolutely nobody. This is a near as damn it, 200,000 pound, 600 horsepower, 200 plus mile an hour, mid-engined, rear-wheel drive rocket. This is a supercar through and through. Simply driving around a small, sleepy Suffolk town such as this, you get all sorts of looks and stares and adoration from people of all ages and walks of life. In fact, James popped over and saw me the other day and he brought in with him a trail of young boys who were cycling past that thought this was basically the bestest thing what they had ever seen. At least that afternoon anyway. For driving around town, the car is fairly competent. It's got the obligatory and rather annoying start-stop. Pulling away from junctions is made a little bit difficult by a throttle pedal and gearbox that are very, very reluctant to get moving. Once on the move, they're absolutely fine, but it's just that initial travel where you need to put your foot down a lot further 
than you think that you might, especially when you're driving a car with the sort of firepower that this has. I'm always very wary of that throttle pedal, but this one really does want you to give it a good firm shove. The view out, as evidenced in the walk around, is just magnificent, and you can see absolutely everything. The, the, Visibility in the rear three quarters is not stunning, but by supercar standards, this is actually a very decent, easy car to place. The rear of the car is actually quite high compared to where you sit. You are right snug down low, and when you follow the car, you can see the occupants are really tucked down. However, driving it in this configuration, i.e. roof down but rear glass raised, it's very civil, very nice, very pleasant. The car makes a nice enough noise for this kind of thing but it's not exactly screaming away now i've got the car in its active mode and i'm going to change the powertrain over into sport which should just sharpen up the throttle and the gearbox response just a bit the handling the suspension for the most part i have currently set to normal note that they do not call it comfort in this car they call it normal you also have sport and track and we're going to play with those in a little bit I thought I would start the week with this car because it is probably the car that people are most likely to buy as their first McLaren. I don't think the person driving this Citroen Picasso is going to be in line to buy one of these, so I'm going to attempt to dispatch them as soon as I possibly can. For complete disclosure, the roads out there at the minute are a little greasy but reasonably dry. It's 11 degrees, so again, it's not bitingly cold, but neither is it stunningly warm. And this car is again on the regular Fitment Pirellis, nothing super fancy. Getting past someone like that who's not doing anywhere near the speed limit is very simple. The car doesn't need to be stretched out. And the gear shift, once you're above about 3,500 RPM, is absolutely stellar. Unlike many cars that I drive and review, this is not the first time that I've driven either one of these or in fact this exact car, which has made my life simultaneously easier and more difficult because I've had some time to work out things that I don't like about the car as well as time to think about things that I really do and there's still a few things that I'm genuinely on the fence about which hopefully by the end of this video I'll have drawn a conclusion about. The ride at road legal speeds in normal mode is actually excellent. The steering feel is also perfection itself. As a former Lotus owner, I have incredibly high standards when it comes to steering. And for that reason, the vast majority of cars that I drive do fall some way short of my expectations. And I will confess that is because I have been spoiled. The first time I drove a 570, I still owned my Evora 400, and I got basically straight out of that car into a 570. And it's basically the only time I can really remember getting into another car from the Lotus and not just not being disappointed with the steering, but actually being genuinely amazed. This is a truly special car in that regard, and it tells you so much more about what the chassis is doing. Now the engine, although it's not lacking for pull load down, definitely does its best work in the higher reaches of the rev range. One issue that I'm really facing this week is how one does a decent review of a car which is capable of smashing through the speed limits with such ridiculous disdain in any way that's not going to land me in serious trouble. Well, that is one of the true joys of the 570 is that at lower speeds, much like my Lotus, it genuinely still feels like a special car. The Audi R8 that I spent some time with, when you're just sort of bimbling along or doing normal motorway type stuff, it just feels too much like any other Audi out there and that in that context isn't really a great thing. The one we drove in particular also did not have the adaptive dampers so it rode very firmly, nowhere near as comfortable as this which you can tell has been really really well tuned for this kind of road. 
the gearbox has the pre-cog feature which McLaren introduced with the 12C which means if you sort of half pull a gear lever it'll make sure that that gear is ready to go because the twin clutch system can only really have one or another ready to go so it's always guessing whether you want to change up or down but occasionally it won't get it right so if you can give it just a little preview a little hint so if you just hold down it'll be so fast I know it sort of defeats the point of having to tell it in advance but trust me it, it does make a difference when you sort of know a road you know your journey you know your route and certainly on track it it will help it will make a very very big difference <laughs> This is an unreasonably fast car. McLaren quote, 570 horsepower, but eh, pretty much everybody knows that it's more like 600 really. In fact, in a straight line, if you're considering the 600 LT, there is next to nothing really to make that car worth going for. And for this kind of stuff, this is probably the better car. I have not driven the 600 LT, so I cannot say for certain, but everybody I know that's driven one says yes, when you're absolutely on it, and certainly when you're on track, it's a better car. But for daily duties, boring kind of stuff, this is probably the best all-rounder. There are some bad things about the car, though. Now, it does move, and it does float a reasonable amount when you get into really, really high-speed stuff, by which I mean triple digits, obviously on private land officer. Putting it into sport mode doesn't help as much as you would think. It does certainly make a difference, and I'll put the car into sport mode now, and yes, you can certainly feel it firm up, but what's not changing clearly is the spring rate, because the springs are set, they are fixed, they cannot be changed. And the car doesn't have the super fancy interconnected proactive chassis control system that its bigger brothers do, and, and it does potentially suffer. I say potentially because I haven't yet driven the 720S and it's been so long since I've driven a 650 that I can't really remember with any degree of accuracy. However, for this kind of stuff, this car is awesome and it's got way, way more grip than you would think possible from this kind of car on this kind of day. Genuinely, it's very easy to make decent progress and because the car talks to you so well, it is, well, it's a hell of a thing. McLaren in many ways are very, very much like Lotus, and that is simultaneously a very good and very bad thing. The worst bit of it is McLaren's, well, quality control. It's shocking. One of the reasons that the video of this being collected didn't go out on time was the fact that there was quite a few issues with it on collection. And this is a car that had been in stock at the dealership for quite a few months, and so there were really no reasons for it. Uh, the issues included quite a bit of damage, and the door on the side being misaligned, and the whole thing just not really being up to standard. It's got some odd quirks as well, like when I got in it at the start of the review, I shut this door, and then this window didn't go up, and that window opened itself. There's no, no logic whatsoever here. And John, James's father, who has a 720, has also been experiencing some electrical gremlins in his car. Overall, it's rather disappointing when you consider the fact that this is a car with a list price of £190,000. McLaren are very quickly getting a reputation that Lotus managed to achieve of basically building cars pretty badly. And that is a reputation that they really, really need to do everything that they can to shake as soon as possible. The McLaren traction control system I currently have in fully on because I'm just not going to be that kind of hero in this video. That's just not how I like to do reviews. But even there, giving it some beans, you can feel the rear end kind of moving about. But it's not daunting, it's not scary, not in the least. It's only when you're really, really seriously pressing on, by which I mean going a lot faster than this, does the car really actually start to move in a way that's disconcerting. It'll squirm under brakes a lot and it shifts about and 
and it's a little odd it doesn't feel like you would expect a 600 horsepower supercar too it feels more like a sort of old-fashioned car and if that's what McLaren were going for that's great but making a chassis move around like that with an engine like this I think a not the best combination however there is also a possibility that a lot of it's due to the tires and the weather most of the time I've been driving this car it's been either cold dark or both and in that circumstance you the tires aren't doing their best and I'll be honest hand on heart I'm just not a big fan of Pirelli's whatsoever you see now in a lot of other cars when you go past people even slowing down and making way for them that'll give you all sorts of rude gestures and things so they just don't like you but in this it garners a real love it, it genuinely does that is something that I deeply miss about my Lotus and it's something that you don't always get with other brands it's certainly not a guarantee but with a McLaren people love you in many many ways a McLaren is the slowest car you can possibly buy because absolutely every time you stop somewhere you're gonna have to spend another 20 to 30 minutes talking to people because they're gonna want to know about your car mister how fast does it go what's a 0 to 60 all that kind of jazz Another big issue with this car is the exhaust. It's not a bad sounding car, not at all. But it's not a great sounding one either. And I think that is actually part of the problem. Allow me to explain. It just doesn't sound. I mean, it's good, but in comparison to my Lotus and to a Ferrari and stuff like that, it doesn't sound like it's doing the RPM that you know that it is. And when it moves you forward at such an incredible rate, I think it's actually lulling you into thinking you're going slower than you are. If it was noisier and crazier and had more character to it, I think it would really, really amp up the experience of the car. And it's just, just something that's missing, especially when this is the sports exhaust. It's just not great. However, my friends at Thorny Motorsport may be able to help with that. And so that's a possible thing for the future. The standard carbon ceramic brakes are excellent. I've heard no squeal from them at all. I have actually driven about 400 miles in this car. And they're very easy to modulate, very well behaved. They're really properly excellent. One thing I can tell you is if you intend to take your 570 on track, you will be well advised to change the pads that they use because as standard, only a couple of track days will completely and utterly destroy both pads and discs and they're not cheap at all. So how do I summarize this car? Well, here's where it gets really, really tricky. List price, this car, 190 odd thousand pounds, and that means you've got to compare it with some pretty serious competition. It's not that far off of a Ferrari 488. Granted, it's still a little bit, but it's not that far off. It's the same league as, say, a, a Lamborghini Huracan. It's a lot more expensive than an R8, and miles more expensive than something like a 911 turbo which i know isn't a supercar at least in my opinion it's not however there are some ludicrous ridiculous deals available on these cars right now and i'm not going to give away the specifics of them because to be honest they change on an almost daily basis but my buddy james at the moment is paying less for this car than he is for his lotus a lot less we ran a finance comparison with a Ferrari 488 and this came out at more or less half the price. It's a seriously cheap car if that's the way you want to buy your vehicles. When you look at it, it's not just a, a supercar that's trying to be a bit of a sports car. This is a supercar for sports car money. And I genuinely, hand on heart, at the start of this review, I wasn't sure whether I was in love with this car or not. The handling at high speeds is still something I want to explore because I'm just not that sold on it, but I am assured that it does get better with experience and with better road temperatures and all that sort of jazz. So I'm going to take other people's words on that. Maybe next year I'll try and organise a mini track day and we can drive some of these things a little bit harder on camera. But as a road car, this thing is sensational and it pulls off that very, very difficult trick of feeling special 
at normal speeds and then of course being capable when the mood takes you of doing some very very silly ones too i'd never have a car in this spec because i am a card carrying tart but i cannot deny the ludicrous value for money of the 570s the one real big negative honestly is mclaren themselves and their dealers they just need to get on the ball and make sure that the cars that are going out the factory gates and then out the doors of the dealership are just better. They, they really, really should be. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed this little video. Please like, comment, subscribe below and hit the notification button and then you'll be made aware of when all the rest of McLaren Week's content is coming out and of course the rest of the stuff on the channel. See you in the next one. Bye bye.